miss going to like Southern Sun and uh, yeah, yeah, stuff with speakers. So it's yeah. not the same. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for attending today's CGD seminar. Before we get started, I'll remind everyone of our CGD code of conduct at these seminars, where we offer constructive feedback, share the air to make sure all voices are heard, acknowledge teamwork, encourage innovation, show appreciation, and consider new ideas. Uh, I'll ask, also ask that everyone please keep themselves muted and hold any questions until the end, except for any clarifying questions. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Adriana Foster joined NCAR this year as a project scientist one in the terrestrial sciences section here in CGD. She received a bachelor's and PhD in environmental sciences from the University of Virginia and subsequently held postdoctoral positions at NASA Gossett Goddard um, Space Center and uh, Northern Arizona University. She is a forest ecologist and ecological modeler, specifically interested in high resolution modeling of forest ecosystems, remote sensing of vegetation characteristics and stress and disturbance vegetation climate interactions. Her talk title today is Disturbances Within the North American Boreal and Arctic Domains, Observations and Potential Future Trends. Uh, so Adriana, take it away. And you're, you're muted, Adriana. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I couldn't find the thing. Um, great, thank you. Can you see my the presentation version of this? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so hi, thank you for having me. So yeah, I started here at NCAR in August um, in TSS, and I'm really excited to be here. And so today I'm gonna talk to you about a project that I 
was working on previously um, with the NASA Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, uh, looking at disturbances within the North American Boreal and Arctic domains. And so NASA's ABOVE program is a large scale study of environmental change in the Arctic and Boreal regions of Western North America, um, as well as implications for ecological systems and society. And so our overarching question is, you know, how vulnerable are or resilient are these ecosystems and society to environmental change? And so this is a 10 year campaign and researchers are making observations at the plot, um, tower, airborne, and orbital scales with the intent to feed all of these data into an integrated modeling framework. So the above study domain covers Alaska as well as Western Canada. And so here's a map by Ju and Masik using Landsat imagery showing greening and browning trends across the region. And so we can see areas uh, with strong greening trends as well as areas with strong browning trends. And so many of these browning areas we can see are due to disturbances like wildfire and insect outbreak. And so disturbances like wildfire, insect outbreak, and then permafrost related disturbances are dominant and integral drivers of ecosystem dynamics in boreal and Arctic systems. And I'm leading a working group within ABOVE with the aim to synthesize the main disturbances, both natural and anthropogenic, within the North American Arctic and boreal regions. So specifically, we are summarizing each disturbance or disturbance type, focusing on temporal dynamics of vegetation loss and recovery. And we're also including case studies of each topic or type where we investigate satellite-derived trends of loss and recovery. And then we're additionally interested in looking at potentials for disturbance interactions, as well as future needs um, to study these disturbances. And so we have a large range of disturbances we're investigating, including fire, uh, biotic disturbances, many permafrost and hydrology related disturbances, as well as some anthropogenic and weather related disturbances. And so for many of our disturbance types, we're looking at these case studies um, investigating Landsat derived vegetation indices before and following the disturbance to analyze the intensity, the time scale of the disturbance and potential recovery following that disturbance. And so we have many case study points um, from within our group. So those that had field work um, in these specific areas. And then we also got a lot of polygons um, from the Alaskan and Canadian Forest Service um, Aerial Forest Health Surveys. And so over each of these points and polygons, we're extracting Landsat 5, 7, and 8 pixels using Google Earth Engine, as well as an R package um, currently being developed by one of my colleagues, Logan Berner. And so for each of these individual field locations that we received, we collected pixels within a 500 meter buffer around the points. And then for each set of polygons, because there were so many and we collected a 25 pixel sample of each of 25 sampled polygon per set. And so this image on the top, you can see a small polygon where we've extracted these 30 meter Landsat pixels from a grid across that polygon. And so all of this resulted in over 14,000 individual pixel locations um, covering years 1984 to 2020. And so for each pixel, we're looking at the full Landsat um, range from five through eight. And so for each of these observations, we filtered out those with clouds, uh, snow, water, and radiometric and geometric errors. So here you can see a histogram of near infrared reflectance and cloud cover for one pixel location across the whole Landsat record. And the light gray corresponds to unfiltered data and the black to the filtered data. So we do end up removing quite a bit of the observations due to high cloud cover. So next we cross calibrate these pixels across all three Landsat sensors. Um, using a random forest model, again, in, in development by Logan Berner. So here we can see Landsat 7 data on the y-axis, um, which we are used as the benchmark because it overlaps with Landsat 5 and 8. And then Landsat 5 and 8 data on the x-axis um, with the raw data on the left and the calibrated data on the right. So once we have these calibrated trajectories, we calculate growing season metrics to derive um, growing season maximum values for several vegetation indices, um, including NDVI, which is a measure of greenness, and NDMI, which is a measure of moisture. So here we can see a trajectory of NDVI for one location, and we can clearly see where some kind of event has occurred in around 2006. 
However, for many of these pixels, especially those that we had derived from these large aerial survey polygons, not every pixel was over an actual disturbance. And so we needed a way to filter out pixels that didn't show any change. And so for that, I used a BFAST algorithm to detect pixels with breakpoints around the time of a known disturbance. So this algorithm functions by fitting trends and detecting breaks from those trends. So here we can see um, the time series and a fitted trend across the whole time series. And then we can see below that this algorithm detected a break in that trend um, around 2006. And so for each of the pixels where we found a breakpoint around the time of the disturbance, I then smoothed the original trajectory so that we could detect these inflection points before and after the disturbance event. And so this was basically to get at, you know, when the disturbance started to be impactful and then how long it took to recover. And so then I normalized the vegetation index to that pre-disturbance mean. And so this was done because we're comparing across many different disturbances and many different regions of Alaska and Canada. So by normalizing to this pre-disturbance mean, we're kind of looking at the relative effect um, of disturbance on the vegetation index. And so I just like to walk through a few of these case studies and disturbances we've analyzed so far. So fire is probably the most well-studied disturbance in the boreal and Arctic domain, both generally and within the NASA above science team. And it's of course very impactful affecting soil conditions above and below ground carbon storage, vegetation characteristics, permafrost um, and energy and water cycling, as well as human health. And in particular in the boreal forest, fire severity and subsequent depth of burn in the soil leads to direct impacts on post-fire tree regeneration. So with higher severity and greater depths of burn leading to more deciduous recruitment following fires, whereas a deeper post-fire organic layer depth, so less burn, often results in coniferous recruitment following fire. And in this, um, in this region, um, this can lead to lasting legacies of vegetation type through interactions with vegetation and soil characteristics. So here's a Landsat trajectory for the Little Black River fire, which occurred in 1998. Um, on the top, you can see um, a true color image of the fire scar. So here uh, we're looking at, again, we're looking at the normalized NDVI and NDMI normalized to the pre-disturbance mean. And so we can see a sharp decline in NDMI and as well as a decline in NDVI, so the greenness and the moisture. Um, and we see this slow recovery following the fire. Um, and interestingly, we've got this decline in NDVI right before the fire. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of some interesting trend that popped up. And we're also looking at biotic disturbances like pests and pathogens. So we've categorized these into a few types. So there are broadleaf defoliators, such as the aspen leaf miner, which feed on the leaves of deciduous species and impact their ability to photosynthesize. So some main effects are growth reduction, deformation, and in some cases, mortality. So here pictured on the top right um, is damage from two different birch leaf miners. There are also needle leaf defoliators, such as the spruce budworm, which feed on needles. So pictured on the bottom right is defoliation from the spruce budworm. So these defoliators also impact photosynthesis growth and often cause mortality as well. And then we have bark beetles, which feed on the cambium and phloem of host trees. So they're often called aggressive because they attack live trees through synchronous sort of mass attacks on individuals. So here on the bottom left, we can see a spruce larva in um, an infested tree or spruce beetle larva. And so these infested trees die from water and carbon starvation stress, both due to the beetles as well as fungal pathogens associated with the beetles. And then finally, we're looking at pathogens such as root rots and fungi. So on the top left, we can see spruce needle rust. And so these pathogens can be actually be quite aggressive and often result in declines in productivity as well as mortality. So in general, stressed vegetation are most susceptible to infestations or infections. Often outbreaks uh, follow in an instigating stressor such as a drought or an El Nino. And then areas with high host availability are also key areas for outbreaks. So in terms of spatial patterns, infestations are multi-scale. They occur at the individual tree level. Here we can see um, a picture of individual infested trees among non-infested trees, but then they spread to whole landscapes and stands. 
So this spread is mediated by host availability, topography, and other factors. So here on the right, we can see mapped spruce beetle infestation in Alaska, and then mapped spruce budworm um, on the left. So temporally, it's a similar story. Infestations at the plant and stand level generally occur over one or a few years, but whole outbreaks can last many years and typically reoccur in cycles. So here's a graph of hectares of spruce beetle infestation in Alaska showing two large outbreaks, one in the Kenai Peninsula in the 90s and one um, just north of Anchorage. So here is a normalized Landsat trajectory for the spruce budworm, which is a needle leaf defoliator, and this is in the Northwest Territories. So we can see declines leading up to this mapped disturbance event, followed by a fairly fast recovery. And then here are trajectories for the spruce beetle and mountain pine beetle, which are those aggressive bark beetles. And the signals here are much more subtle, especially for NDVI in the spruce beetle on the top. And that's likely due to the delayed response in the visible range from infestation. And so unlike with the mountain pine beetle where we can see this characteristic red color from infested trees, the needles of the spruce beetle infested trees kind of fade gradually from green to gray. Though we do see declines in NDMI leading up to um, these disturbances due to moisture stress. So we also have many permafrost related disturbances, which all impact soil, vegetation type, carbon stocks, hydrology, and climate. So for example, thaw slumps are a rapid thawing and mass wasting along a headwall. The thawed material is then transported by erosion and fluvial transport. And this disturbance impacts downstream environments as well as terrestrial vegetation composition, structure, and productivity. And these events are predicted to increase in magnitude and frequency with climate change. So near surface permafrost degradation is expected to increase linearly over the next 20 to 30 years due to temperature increases, but abrupt thaws within these landscapes are also increasing. So this nonlinear change is exacerbated by extreme precipitation events, um, including shoulder season rain or drought. So here we can see a thaw slump in the northern Yukon that occurred until about 2018. So this disturbance here took longer to occur overall, and we can maybe see a bounce back following the disturbance, but it's fairly early to tell. Lake drainage um, is usually the abrupt loss of water from thermokarst lakes. The vegetation usually rapidly colonizes the drained area, and then this area can develop new permafrost once the basin has drained. And the frequency of these events is also increasing in key areas, and this has implications for increasing carbon stocks, though the magnitude of this increase regionally is unknown. So here's a Landsat trajectory for a gradually draining and greening basin in northern Alaska. So unlike some other lakes which drained rapidly, this one seemed to drain more slowly over time since about 2000, and we also see this slow greening over time. So we're also interested in investigating anthropogenic disturbances such as oil and gas wells. So these are in situ extraction infrastructures for oil and gas. Um, a thick mineral fill layer is placed on top of the landscape. Um, and this just results in complete removal of vegetation as well as compaction of soil and peat. And this also disrupts hydrologic conditions surrounding the well site. So here we can see a normalized trajectory for oil and gas in the Yukon territories with a very sharp decline in NDVI and NDMI and a fairly slow recovery. Uh, seismic lines are another of our anthropogenic disturbances we're interested in. So these are a network of linear clearings cut across wetlands and forests for subsurface oil and gas exploration. So these um, also remove, involve removal of trees, compaction of the soil, and changes to hydrology. And generally, tree recovery within these lines is poor. And these are actually the largest anthropogenic disturbance across boreal and tundra ecosystems with 345,000 kilometers in Alberta peatlands alone. So here we can see the seismic line trajectory in Alberta, which was officially started in 2002, according to records, though the trajectories show declines before. So we do see recovery in NDVI and a very slow recovery in NDMI, potentially from the surrounding area. So we're also looking at logging, and here's a logging site in Canada where we can see decline in NDVI and NDMI 
and recovery almost to above um, the predisturbance mean in NDVI. So we're interested in how to compare all of these disturbances. And one way we thought of was to compare the disturbance slope in the trajectory, as well as how many years this initial change in the trend took to occur. So here are those plotted here. The dot shows the normalized NDVI slope on the left and NDMI slope on the right. And then the color of the dot corresponds to the time it took that disturbance to occur. So we have you know, ranging from one year to four years with these disturbances. And then we're also interested in this post-disturbance slope in the vegetation index. So here we've plotted that. So here we're trying to get at the intensity in terms of the initial slope and the time it took to occur, as well as the potential recovery magnitude and direction. And so we can see some spread in these values. Interestingly, oil and gas wells was the most intense in terms of the initial slope and only took a couple years to occur. And so as we add more case studies to to this analysis, I think you know, we'll have some interesting patterns to explore. And then we also wanted to describe these disturbances in terms of time and spatial scale. So we're looking at the average size of a disturbance, the typical frequency and intensity, as well as the time scale. And so all of these data we gathered from literature surveys and our own knowledge. And so here's a PCA that we created from these metrics. So we can see that these four time and space scale metrics basically split evenly in terms of the explained variance and the direction. So with frequency and intensity along this first principle component and size and time scale along the second. And then we can also see that many of these disturbances are grouped together um, with the exception of permafrost disturbances, they kind of span this whole range. Okay, you know, so maybe you're thinking, you know, why should CGD care about these disturbances? Are they really that important on a large scale? Well, a 2014 study by Fisher et al. compared uh, 40 terrestrial biosphere models and found high variability in both the magnitude and the sign of the annual carbon flux over Alaska. And a follow-on study cited soil carbon, plant biomass, PFTs, and NPP as these major missing pieces to the modeling puzzle all of which are heavily influenced by disturbances. And then more recently, one of my colleagues from the above uh, disturbance working group conducted a study which derived above ground biomass within this region um, using Landsat from 1985 through 2015. And then here on the left, we can see a comparison of the Landsat derived biomass change in black to that predicted by many different um, CES, or sorry, CMIP models um, with the multi-model mean in blue, and then we can see CSM2 here. And so in general, these models are over-predicting above ground biomass um, increases, as is CESM, and the authors attributed this overestimation to a lack of or inadequate consideration of disturbances, and particularly wildfire, in many of these models. And so this improvement in model simulation of wildfire you know, it's clearly very important and can have important feedbacks to climate. And so I'd like to take a closer look at fire in general, but with an eye towards the rest of the disturbances I've covered here as well. So we know that disturbances like wildfire impact forest characteristics. So here's a graph from a study looking at fire effects on stand structure and species composition. So these top two old growth forest stands look very similar in terms of their distribution of tree sizes, as well as species composition. Now this third graph, however, is of a post fire stand, which shows quite different structure and composition with the addition of this pine species. And so these potential shifts in vegetation type have the capacity to feed back to climate. So for example, many models are predicting increasing deciduous fraction in the boreal region as a result of climate change and fires. And we know that evergreen forests have a lower albedo than do deciduous forests. So here's a figure um, on the right from a study by Beck et al looking at post-fire winter and summer albedo for a high severity burn which resulted in a shift to a deciduous stand and in a low severity burn which remained evergreen. And so um, we can see that the albedo in the winter and in the summer um, is higher for the deciduous stand. And so a shift towards the higher deciduous fraction could actually lead to a cooling effect on the landscape. 
Now, in contrast, predicted shifts northward in the tundra taiga ecotone also impacts albedo because forest cover has a lower albedo than does tundra. And so this could lead to positive feedback to further climate warming. And then, you know, specifically post-fire regrowth and the net CO2 forcing of fires are highly dependent on pre-fire species composition and structure, as well as fuel loading and type. And so fire, you know, it impacts biogeochemical cycling through release of greenhouse gases and through these subsequent changes in albedo and water cycling. And so the FATES team, including Jackie Schumann and I here at NCAR, are working on improving wildfire simulation in forest demography models. So with this new Spitfire model that we, um, Jackie and others, have added into FATES, um, the rate of spread and fire intensity are based on a combination of fire weather and fuel characteristics. And then here we can see a simulation with a forest gap model, which is similar to FATES, but allows for individual tree simulation, but with less specificity in terms of the photosynthesis and allocation. And so here we can see how we can track species composition and forest structure over time, which also impacts the fuel loading and characteristics. And then when the fire occurs, by dynamically simulating vegetation and fuels, we can more accurately capture flame height and intensity, which will in turn impact overall combustion as well as emissions from those fires. And then following the fire, we can then dynamically track the vegetation again to capture forest regrowth. And so, as I said, that simulation was done with a gap model called UVAFME. Um, it's an individual tree based forest gap model that has a long history drawing on work from um, actually Gordon Bonin here at NCAR. And UVAFME simulates individual tree establishment, growth, and death on independent patches of a forested landscape. And these trees grow annually um, through diameter growth in response to external factors like sunlight and temperature, uh, soil moisture and soil nutrients, and then trees compete with one another for resources and can die through low growth or through disturbances. And so the model has been updated for use in the North American boreal zone, drawing on much of the work done by Gordon when he was working with gap models um, with the addition of permafrost dynamics, shrub and moss growth forms, as well as, and I've added in this Spitfire model to UVAFME. So this model has been found to reliably produce forest characteristics when compared to inventory data. So here on the left, we can see average total basal area for about a thousand sites across Alaska and Canada grouped by forest type and ecoregion. And so here the modeled and measured basal areas agree pretty well. Uh, model output on abiotic and biotic vegetation drivers also compare well to field observation. So on the left for those same uh, thousand sites, uh, we can see inventory versus modeled soil organic layer depth. So not only is this model able to reliably produce forest dynamics and characteristics, but it can also simulate the underlying vegetation drivers that influence such dynamics. And so as I said, now that I'm at NCAR, I'm working on the FATES team towards regional and global simulations with FATES. And so much of the knowledge gained from my work with the GAP model can be applied to FATES. And there are a lot of shared similarities between a model like UVAFME and FATES. They both consider vegetation structure and detailed vegetation ecosystem connections. Um, they're also both based on these first principles of ecology. And then both of these models have this mechanistic Spitfire model subroutine within them. So as I said, this Spitfire model simulates fire ignition, rate of spread, fire intensity, tree mortality, and combustion based on a combination of fire weather and lighting strike frequency, as well as fuel loading, um, geometry, and moisture. And in particular, we can simulate the importance of dynamic fuels for fire simulation. So for example, fuel litter is added to these litter pools, including deciduous and coniferous leaf litter, twigs and moss for these uh, fast burning fuels. And we also have small and large branches as well as, as live shrubs and trees less than six feet in height. And then in the boreal zone, this dead fuel decays from fresh to fibric to humic. And in the UVAFME version of the model, we update the geometry of the litter pools as they decay to simulate this change um, in bulk density and surface area um, as the litter decays. And this is important for wildfire behavior. 
So here on the left, we can see UVA FME simulated species specific biomass before and following a moderate intensity fire at stand age 100. So we can see species composition shifting slightly following the fire with more black spruce and jack pine biomass in the blues, um, whose serotonous cones allow for rapid colonization following the fire. And then on the right, we can also see change in the organic layer and moss depth um, for the same simulation. And so I added smoldering combustion of the organic layer um, to the UVFME version of the model uh, based on a fire residence time and soil moisture. And so we can see burning of the organic and moss layer with eventual regrowth of these layers following the fire. And so to validate these updates, I compared simulated above and below ground combustion to about 300 observations across Canada and Alaska. And here we can see comparisons of observed in purple and modeled in green uh, below ground combustion on the left and above ground combustion on the right, grouped by ecoregion. And so we can see that the model is producing the combustion fairly well and also produces the variation in above ground combustion that we see um, by ecoregion. So broadly, it seems that this updated Spitfire model is performing well within the North American boreal zone, and we're working on bringing in these specific updates um, into FAPES. So with improved fire simulation, we can investigate potential future fire regimes. So it's predicted that fuel flammability will increase in the future with increasing temperatures, drying conditions, and uh, more frequent lightning. But models also predict an increase in deciduous fraction with climate change for the boreal zone. And this somewhat throws a wrench into our increasing flammability theoretical model uh, because deciduous litter is in general less flammable than coniferous litter due to both its geometry and the to overall total loading of coniferous versus deciduous stands. So for example, here on the left is simulated fuel loading uh, by fuel type for a deciduous stand um, on the left and a spruce stand on the right. And so this spruce stand has much more litter overall and also contains moss litter and has a higher proportion of these fast burning fuels. And even just this difference in litter composition will lead to differences in flammability. So here is a graph of reaction intensity, which is essentially the energy available to heat unburned fuel. Um, and this is a as a function of fuel surface area to volume ratio and fuel bulk density. And then here we can see specific values for this deciduous and spruce stand. And so we can see that even though in this graph we're actually holding the fuel loading and moisture content constant for both of these stands, um, the spruce litter just by virtue its, of its geometry alone is more flammable. So if our original prediction for flammability were to hold, this would mean that fuel drying is high enough to outweigh this shift in litter type. However, if deciduous fraction is more important, we might expect flammability to level off or even decrease over time. And so we have this interplay between top-down climate controls and bottom-up fuel controls on wildfire. And we can use a model that dynamically tracks vegetation and fuels to answer questions like this. So to investigate these interactions, I simulated um, the gap model at 300 combustion sites um, forced with climate change out to 2100. And this climate change involved increasing temperatures as well as precipitation. And we also forced an increase in lightning strike frequency as predicted by some recent papers. And then I also simulated a control simulation where we ran the model out to 2100, but used historical distributions of climate rather than projected climate change. So here on the left, we can see above ground biomass and deciduous fraction over time colored by ecoregion. And then on the right, we can see this change in those outputs um, from the control simulation with, with cl without climate change. And so for ecoregions like um, interior Alaska and the Taiga Plain, we see decreases in biomass over time. But um, for the Taiga Plain and the Boreal Cordillera, we actually see um, sort of no change or maybe even increasing biomass over time. And then in terms of deciduous fraction, um, we see increases in deciduous fraction, um, especially for interior Alaska. And so this declining biomass and fuel and increasing deciduous fraction leads to declines in fire intensity and severity at these sites. So here I'm showing distributions of fire intensity on the top and fuel combustion on the bottom for just for sites in interior Alaska uh, for the control simulation and then RCP 4.5 and 8.5 climate change. So we can see that fire intensity here declines as does combustion. 
um, with climate change. And then we can see that this occurred despite fuel drying, which is plotted here. So in large part due to our reduction in fuel loading seen on the bottom right. So notably, um, the average intense, though the average intensity in combustion declined, um, the upper ranges still remained fairly high, indicating the potential for extreme events even into the future. So it's important, it's also important to note that these simulations were conducted um, without spatial propagation of wildfire between grid cells and at only 300 point locations. So the impact of increasing fire area and these mega fires that we're seeing within the Boreal region are also very, very important factors to consider. But um, this decline that we modeled in fire intensity was strongest at sites where deciduous fraction declined the most. So here we can see those same distributions for fire intensity, but for sites that had little change um, in deciduous fraction on the left, and then sites that had at least a 30% increase in deciduous fraction on the right. So we can see that we, where we had these sites that had an increase in tissuous fraction, we had very strong declines in fire intensity. So with this dynamic vegetation and fuels simulated by demographic models, um, we can see the importance of these bottom-up controls on wildfire. And at least at the local scale, it seems that this, these bottom-up controls are outweighing uh, the top-down climate controls. And so, the, uh, with the ability to better simulate fire behavior, this will allow us to better simulate uh, feedbacks onto climate from wildfire and interactions between climate disturbances and vegetation. And though many of the disturbances do occur at a local scale, they have the capacity to impact global climate. So for example, the recent large fires in Australia in 2019 and 2020 resulted in a large injection of aerosols into the stratosphere, you know, the largest that has been seen in the satellite record. And here is just a MODIS image showing uh, smoke from these fires. And Fasulo et al. conducted a CESM experiment where they found that these aerosols cooled global climate overall and was a similar effect to what is seen after a major extra, extra tropical volcanic eruption. So even though these fires occurred during a relatively short time and in one location, they still impacted global climate within CESM. So it's clear that these local scale disturbances have the capacity to feed back to regional and global climate. And with CESM, we have the ability to capture that effect. And so, you know, as we're discovering with this NASA above disturbance working group, um, there are many other disturbances within the boreal and Arctic domain that are also highly important for vegetation and climate feedbacks. So for example, biotic disturbances like insect outbreaks cause changes in water and energy fluxes and decline in NPP. So here in the top right, we can see eddy flux measurements over an outbreak um, with the green lines showing pre-outbreak conditions and the red and gray lines showing uh, outbreak conditions. And so we can see that evapotranspiration decreased and NEE increased or became less negative as a result of the outbreak. And then additionally, these um, outbreaks often result in a flush of beetles and litter, which impacts decomposition as well. And so with a demographic model like FATES, we can simulate stand structure and composition response to insect outbreak. So for example, here's um, an example applying a bark beetle infestation within the GAP model that I used to work with. So we can see decline in spruce biomass in green, which is the host of this bark beetle. And then on the bottom, we can see interesting cycles over time in biomass killed by the beetles over time, which corresponds to these real life outbreaks that we see um, with through observations. And so this was implemented with UVA FME. So I was not tracking energy and water cycling, but if fates, with, with fates, we could actually do that and capture these energy impacts. And then for something like logging and management, there's currently a logging module within FATES and Joshua Rady is developing a separate model to incorporate um, detailed management operations, which should allow for more realistic impacts on climate feedbacks. So that will be an exciting um, feature to implement in the boreal region as well. And then for these permafrost and hydrology related disturbance, this is um, Sean Swenson's hill slope hydrology model allows for hill slope specific modeling of vegetation and soil conditions. So here each column is defined by its hill slope position and water can flow between these columns. And so in the future, this could be, uh, this model structure and methodology could be used to simulate these abrupt thaw events that we're seeing. So many of these disturbances have the potential to interact. 
Um, here's a matrix the above work disturbance working group has been working on to summarize potential disturbance interactions. So here we can see the driver. So this would be what which disturbance occurred first, and then the potential response. So which you know how it affects potential subsequent disturbances. And reds correspond to a strong positive effect, whereas blues correspond to strong negative. And so for um, you know, for example, we can see that wildfire um, is a positive driver of several other disturbances such as pests, um, drought, permafrost degradation, and lake drainage. And so with dynamic and process-based modeling, we can simulate all of these interactions. So, you know, currently we're experiencing a boom in remote sensing technology advancements, as well as an investment in long-term comprehensive and spatially representative observational databases. And so this allows us to test and develop our models with increasing scale and specificity and to add in important processes like disturbances into demographic models, and then to implement these important climate feedbacks. So with a robust vegetation model coupled with CESM, we can make meaningful contributions to climate policy, as well as more local impacts on climate and disturbance vulnerable communities, and assist managers and other stakeholders with on the ground management decisions. And so with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources, as well as my co-authors, which include uh, much of the, uh, you know, the above multi-disturbance working group, as well as many others. And with that, I will take any questions if there's time. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Adriana, for sharing your work. So um, for folks, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Please feel free to um, raise your hands or um, enter questions in the chat, and I'd be happy to read them. All right, um, Gordon, go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Adriana. That was a really great uh, presentation, and uh, I appreciate the shout out to work that I did years ago. But just to for all of CGD to know, I tried to do something and it was moderately successful. But it was really uh, Jackie working in the Far East and Adriana working in North America that really brought this idea of a circumpolar boreal forest together. So they really did what I wasn't completely able to do. So, but anyways, but that's sort of my point that I want to get at is. There's a, you know, I've sort of come to conclude if you look at the history of ecology and earth system models, it's really driven by geoscientists. And geoscientists are sort of saying what is good ecology and what's bad ecology and what we should have in our models. And you can see this with CLM in our classic sort of biogeochemical model that's just these box and arrows. But the gap models, UVA, FME, is completely the opposite. It's actually sort of more authentic in terms of its ecological processes. The, the biogeochemical models work mathematically, but aren't realistic. The gap models are very realistic in what they do. And then there's fates in between trying to uh, bridge those gaps. So what are your thoughts about how we can actually put more authentic ecology into the earth system models from an ecological perspective like you and Jackie are, you know, and uh, what, are, what are the opportunities that we have in fates? I think you actually sort of were hitting, getting at those talking about fire and disturbance, but I'd like to hear more of your thoughts on this continuum we have of the individual based model to fates to, you know, what we don't want anymore, which is these box and arrow biogeochemical models. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, it's a huge question. And I think, you know, with the gap models, it's, it's true that, yeah, they are based in these sort of ecological theory, and they were, you know, one of the first ecological models to be developed for these forest models. Um, and those are kind of couched in these really high intensive field surveys and forestry um, applications. And so, you know, a lot of people really delved into you know, forest dynamics and theory and applied that in a modeling framework. And I think what the gap models, you know, don't really get at is these climate feedbacks and these really uh, mechanistic way of allocating carbon. And, you know, we don't have to worry about um, mass balance in gap models. Um, we don't really worry about that. And so I think, you know, with, with having transitioning from the gap model to fates, you know, to the big leaf model, we get more specific in terms of where the carbon is going, but maybe less specific in terms of the forest dynamics and theory. And I think, you know, we can eat, we can bring in that theory from that we've learned from the forestry models into fates, 
where we have that ability to actually track where the carbon is going and, and how the leaf albedo and all that is affecting the climate. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's it's definitely something that I'm very excited about. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks for that answer. That was great. All right, Dave has a hand up. Yeah, thanks, uh, Adriana. So at the beginning of your presentation, you you know you went through and cataloged all the different disturbances you know occurring across the Arctic and the boreal system, and characterized the you know the time scale of the disturbance and then the response. And the question I have is, you know, that's really good to understand that to try to get some understanding. But we're dealing with a situation in the Arctic where the the conditions are changing so fast that you know, is our understanding of a, of a response to a disturbance that's occurring now or has in the recent past still going to hold 20, 30, 40 years from now when the, you know, it's much warmer, the hydrologic conditions have changed, the thermal state of permafrost has changed dramatically. And so if that's going to change, then how are we, how are we going to sort of validate whether our modeling responses are anything like realistic? Yeah, that's a good point. I guess I see that as you know, impetus for putting in these sort of mechanistic um, ways of how, you know, you know, we know that cryoturbation is this repeated thawing and freezing. And, you know, we can, if we know how that functions physically and geophysically, we can try to add those specific processes in, in the hopes that, you know, even in the future, we'll be getting it right under different conditions. And, you know, we also have, you know, these disturbances are also occurring across these different, um, bio, you know, sort of ecoregions within North American boreal. And, you know, they also occur in um, pan boreally. And so I think, you know, by testing the model within, you know, the whole sort of whole span of pan boreally, we can kind of try to hedge our bets and say that, okay, you know, we're capturing it at the Southern margins of where these things occur and the Northern margins of where these things occur. We're capturing them when we have this extreme precipitation event. And I think just by, you know, really, robustly testing the model under all these different conditions, we can try to have confidence in, you know, what the model will produce in the future. But yeah, that's always a crucial question. Is it just because we're getting it right now doesn't mean that we're going to get it right in 30 years or, you know, 100 years. But, um, you know, I think if we just robustly test it across all these different ecotypes, we'll have a better chance. <laughs> yeah. All right, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think you were saying that you were predicting reduced fire amounts in the future, but hasn't it been true that over the last uh, five years or so, the amount of fire in the boreal forest has increased rather dramatically, especially in Siberia? So if that's true, how do you, uh, how do you get accommodate these two things? Sorry, Adrian, I think you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, as I said, this, this model does not look at um, spatial propagation of fires. And we know that these mega fires in the boreal region are really important. And this is also, it's also important to note that this is spanning 2006 to 2100. And so, you know, um, I think I'm more interested, I'm interested in looking at sort of like, what does the next 10 years look like? versus, you know, maybe 30 years from now or 100 years from now. Um, but, you know, when we consider these dynamic fuels, we see that um, as sites convert to deciduous forest, they are less flammable. And it turns out that um, the intensity declines. Um, so that conversion to deciduous has not started happening yet? Um, it, it definitely has, but I think it's not as, you know, this model, not as widespread as, you know, it would be in maybe like 50 years from man, this model's perspective. All right, uh, there's a question from Jackie. Hey, Adriana, um, thanks for that great talk. Um, can you, it, so you talked a lot about disturbance and well, actually, before I start, uh, to Peter's point about increased fires, there's a dramatic difference between the North American boreal forest 
versus the Eurasian boreal forest. And so they have very different fire dynamics in terms of the um, species composition, et cetera. But um, that's like a separate conversation. Um, and so for Adriana, I wanted you to get your input on, you know, you talked a lot about disturbance and capturing disturbance through modeling. And so can you talk about the challenges or opportunities of capturing recovery? So the flip side of disturbance is what happens to this vegetation in this recovery period? I think you're muted again. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Okay, so yes, capturing this recovery is is definitely very important, and you know that's kind of what we can do with these forest structure and demography models. Um, and I also think you know we know in the boreal region, um, it's really important to capture the soil conditions following the fire as well. So this depth of burn is going to be highly important for determining which species can readily colonize following the fire, um, and you know. I think improvements in the regeneration um, portions of these forest models and like fates and UVA for me are gonna be really important into the future. And, you know, historically um, ca like capturing these um, processes and with equations has been really difficult because it's, you know, it's hard to sample just thousands of seedlings and over time. And so that's been a difficult process, but I think as we are understanding in the boreal region that these regeneration processes are highly important, there's more and more field studies coming out and we can incorporate that knowledge into our models. All right, uh, the next question is um, from Richard Panetta, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree, this is really an excellent talk. Uh, there were a whole lot of things that, uh, a lot of points of view that you gave us I'd like to have, at one point, and it was just at one point, you mentioned that in a particular situation, um, cell to cell transmission of fire was not uh, included. Was that just in one? So that's a very simple uh, question, but more generally, I imagine just looking at the things you're talking about that there are a very large number of tunable parameters. That, that's, I imagine that. And so um, when you get a good fit to observations, how do you know that, that, that there's not more than one way to tune and particularly how forests recover uh, seems, which was just asked about, seems um, that you could get different responses for different tunings that fit past data. It's just a question. Yeah, I mean, that's, Absolutely true. Um, so for, you know, my work here, you know, my, my a angle was to try not to tune. And so like I used parameters that were in these original, this original Spitfire model or from the literature. And then I just ran the model across all these different um, ecotypes. And, you know, as you can see, like, you know, it's not perfect. Um, we've got some over prediction in the Tiger shield of combustion some under prediction in the taiga plane, but, you know, I didn't want to go and tune it because, you know, realistically, if I were to do that, probably each one of these would, would have its, you know, own parameter. Um, each one of these sites would have an individual parameter. Um, but are, but I are there of, like a hundred parameters or are there several? For the fire model? Um, well, I don't, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know, you know, the number of parameters, but, you know, specifically parameters that are important for combustion are sort of what is the flammability of fuel? You know, how much does of fuel does how much fuel burns at a specific moisture content? That's really important um, for both the above and below ground fuels. So that's um, like a an equation that has parameters, like two parameters um, per fuel type. And then as for the species, um, we actually you know, we take a lot of those species parameters. They're really different from say CLM or FATES. Uh, PFT parameters because they're much more generalistic. So they'd have parameters like um, what's the average maximum uh, diameter of a tree, the average maximum age and height. And that all goes into calculating how a tree grows over time. And then they have sort of these tolerance parameters, like how tolerant is it, uh, this species from, you know, one to six to drought conditions. 
And so it's the gap models are much, I don't know, you don't tune them as much because they're a little more, they're less specific in terms of how exactly, you know, this leaf photosynthesizes. Um, but that's certainly, you know, um, something that people are working on in fates. And I think, yeah, concerning with overfitting is, is very, it's a big concern. And I think by comparing across, you know, I did a thousand sites um, using the same parameters for the species um, across all those sites and it did pretty well. And so I think, you know, balancing that model robustness um, with realism and, you know, not too sensitive is um, really important. Okay, thank you. Um, great, uh, Jan, go ahead. Hi, Adriana, uh, this is Jan, very nice talk. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, actually I have done a little bit about like remote sensing and like the uh, land view and wild fire simulation. So one question is, um, do you actually use uh, some sort of ground truth data to validate like the um, satellite observations? And if so, like what kind of like ground truth data that you use? Sorry, the 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 Landsat observations is that what yeah. you? Yes. No, so we a lot of the um, sites that we took were from actual field sites, and so um, we are not actually validating them from like a, I guess measuring like say if we measured biomass over time. Um, we haven't done that though. That's you know something that we could do, but it's sort of like a it's a question of if we actually have that data. Um, but you know, we do know that that disturbance occurred at that time. So we have sort of a, um, you know, a known disturbance event um, and we can look at it in you know, high resolution imagery to see like, okay, yes, we're actually looking at a fire that occurred, um, but we have not gone to comparing it to say bio, like actual measured biomass or productivity um, changes. I see. So a related question is um, because you mentioned about this disturbance when I thought about disturbance, I, I always first have to define like a mean state. Like, um, so like, uh, and you're talking about like those dis disturbances as like events, for example, like fire or um, bark beetle infestation. But what about some um, like a slowly varying variable such as like a, a gradual drying? Like, do you, do, do you describe like the gradual drying as a disturbance as well? Or, like, if this is like the disturbance, how do you define like a mean state? I, yeah, just yeah. Like no, that's something that we've kind of been going back and forth on and whether to include, because I had in this table that what disturbances we're looking at, we had these drought and freezing mm -hmm. drought. And, you know, I think we've, as a group, we've been going back and forth whether to, you know, delve into that because it kind of opens up this can of worms of, you know, a lot of the ones that I showed were these pulse disturbances where, yeah, like an event occurs and then we get a response and we can clearly see when that event occurred in, you know, in Landsat or in imagery. Um, but yeah, with these drought, you know, that can happen over, you know, decades, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. I think these sort of press disturbances where we're slowly stressing the system, um, we haven't delved into that as much. And I think it's sort of a question of, scope of, of the project that we're working on, but it's definitely important, especially in conjunction with these other disturbances, these sort of pulse disturbances that we're looking at. Yeah. I see. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Well, not seeing any other questions, um, I'd like to thank Adriana one more time and the audience for a great conversation. Um, and I'll hope to see you all this time next week. Take care. Thank you.